Graham is an Associate Director of Nursing and Infection and Prevention and Control, the Clinical Sustainability Lead for the Great Western Hospital Ages Foundation Trust. And just to confirm, Graham, that we can see your, your slides. You can. Over to you. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so as well as uh, my role at Great Western Hospital, I'm also the Sustainability Lead for the Infection Prevention Society, um, hence my uh, interesting gloves from a, both an infection prevention point of view and sustainability. Um, but I've been asked now uh, to talk to about some of the other downsides of, of gloves. So I want to talk to you about um, the, the human cost uh, that comes from the way our uh, glove supply chain and glove manufacturing process uh is set up, um, but also talk about the environmental costs um, that come from the, the carbon footprint um, of gloves. Um, so, move on. There we go. Um, so, um, the uh, Brighton and Sussex Medical School have um, some excellent researchers uh, who uh, look into sustainability of healthcare practices and products. Um, and here you can see um, the carbon footprint of individual uh, items of PPE. Um, and you can see that the carbon footprint of a glove, one glove, one single glove, 26 grams of CO2. So it's not, you know, it's not massive, obviously, is it for just one glove. And you can see that that includes the, the production uh, of the material itself, um, but also includes um, the the fact that it gets disposed of as waste and the transport and the um, production of the packaging material. So it's the, the whole um, package, um, if you will, for that for that one glove. Um, gloves obviously are, are dwarfed by things like gowns, um, as you'd expect. Um, quite a lot more goes into a gown. Um, and obviously we're here to talk about gloves, but I think it's, it's worth just saying gowns have a really high footprint um, uh, and where we can move to reusable ones, uh, we, we should be doing that too. But I'll, I'll, I'll talk mainly about gloves, obviously. So that's one glove. Now in a box, you've got a hundred. Um, so fairly obviously we can scale that up. Um, so a, a box of gloves we can assume would be 2.6 kilograms um, of CO2 um, equivalent emitted. Is that a lot? Uh, I don't know enough to know off the top of my head whether that's a lot. Um, so let's try and put some context to that. So according to the Department of Transport, um, the average car in the UK emits 221.4 grams of CO2 per mile. So we can do a comparison, um, just dividing one by the other. So one box of gloves and I felt it was important to show a picture of a glove being used inappropriately there. One box of gloves is roughly equivalent to driving 12 miles in a car in terms of the impact that it will have, the carbon it will emit uh, or cause to be emitted. Again, we can scale that up. Um, so just take a random time period. Um, well, it's the time period that that paper we looked at earlier um, covered so February to August 2020 and I appreciate that's a, a time when glove use spiked uh, for obvious COVID related reasons um, but I don't think we've seen a big reduction um, or not as big as we would like since then but just to give you an idea so in that six month period in 2020 the NHS used 1.8 billion gloves um, so that's a carbon footprint of 47 nearly 48 million kilos of co2 equivalent um and then we can put that in terms of a car so that's driving 216 million miles in your average car which is like driving to the moon and back 450 times and that was just for six months we don't need any more co2 in our atmosphere we've put enough up there. Um, this shows how it's changed over the last 800,000 years. This is data from, from NASA, uh, taken from ice cores and so on. And you can see how it goes up and down naturally between two and 300 parts per million, roughly. Um, but for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, it had never been over 300 parts per million um, until we started burning things on the right-hand end of that chart. And you can see how CO2 is rapidly um, climbing upwards. And I probably, I, I'm 
preaching to the converted here, but anything we can do to reduce the amount of CO2 we're putting up in the atmosphere it has got to be a good thing. Um, so driving to the moon and back unnecessarily 450 times every uh, every six months is something we should definitely try to stop. So that's the climate impact that you know just just a glove um, has. To now talk about the the human impact. So I don't know what your picture is of how gloves are manufactured. Um, automated process, um, not much human intact, or is it, you know, uh, factory workers? Would they be like these factory workers where they've got good PPE given to them or happy smiling faces, having a nice break and a chat? Sadly, it's not, it's not quite like that. Um, most of our gloves um, are made in either Malaysia or China, um, areas of the country where labour rights are not so well protected as they are here or in, in Europe and other what we would call more developed countries. Um, so the picture is definitely not not quite so good. So this is an example. So um, this is it is definitely not a very automated process. So uh, this is a worker putting the raw material um, that's needed to make the gloves onto the um, conveyor belt. Um, he's not got any protection on his uh, arm, so his arm is covered in that material. Um, and he's about to put that on, on the conveyor belt um, by hand. It doesn't look completely safe way of working. I mean, he's got a hard hat, but I'm not sure how that's going to protect him particularly. Um, and it doesn't. So this is a typical injury that's, that's seen um, on this production line uh, as people get there. Uh, arms caught in the machines uh, and this is another worker uh, making up uh, the, the the polymer I guess that, that's used to make the gloves and again has he got anything protecting him there again he's got a hard hat uh, but he's not got anything to protect his eyes to protect his skin uh, to protect his uh, his mouth nose um, so not great working conditions certainly not something we would we would tolerate here I mean, they look quite happy, though, I guess, maybe. Um, so maybe they're happy in their work. The facts don't really bear that out either. Um, so um, this was a report. Um, I'll, I'll show you the link for it in a, or the, the uh, title of the report in a minute. A report in 2021 uh, speaking to lots of workers uh, in, in these glove uh, manufacturing firms. Um, quite a lot of them have to pay out, pay a loan um, to pay recruitment take out a loan to pay recruitment fees. So they have to pay a fee to a recruitment agent to even get the job. Um, and paying off those fees takes them about 12 months. So they're essentially working for free for that first year. Now they do that in the hope of uh, a better life for their family because they will get, you know, after that year, they will get some money which they can send home. This is a lot of these workers are migrant workers. Um, so they're recruited um, from very, very poor countries. Um, but they, Two thousand pounds is is a huge amount. That's you know obviously they're a, a year's salary. Now that's illegal, um, and so a, a third of those uh, interviewed reported they've been threatened by their recruitment AG agency and told not to speak to them about the recruitment freeze because it, it, even in these countries with with less good workers' rights than we have, these are illegal. But it still goes on. So that means they are unable to leave. They're trapped. They're trapped in that employment. It doesn't matter what their conditions are like. They can't leave. They've got they've got those loans to pay off. They work an average of 12 hours a day. Now, I appreciate I'm speaking probably mainly to critical care nurses who think nothing of a 12 hour shift. That's normal. Um, but you probably do get days off. Um, so 10 percent of those interviewed reported they'd had no days off on average in the last three months. So they'd worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day for the last three months. And a third of them had just one day off per month. And half of them um, report living in congested accommodation. Typically the kind of accommodation they're living in is shipping containers. So shipping containers, those metal boxes stacked on top of each other. Um, and that's where they live. The, uh, the factories are tend to be away from population centers so there's no opportunity for them to um, do anything else they are either uh, in their accommodation or they're working um, 
lots of stories have come out from interviewing these staff um, from observations there are audits that go on to, to to check the working conditions companies have ways of finding way you know ways around those audits but when they when um these investigators actually spoke to staff we had uh cases of uh an, an employee for example who had a, a disagreement with with management um so he was imprisoned in the factory uh for five days um, he was made to give his uh, ATM card uh, to security uh, to pay for his food. Um, uh, accounts of uh, beatings, uh, people being locked into their accommodation. Um, so that glove that we're using, it has consequences, real human consequences um, on the people who are manufacturing it. And the more we use them, the more demand there is. The, more, the worse those conditions get. There was a marked worsening in, in conditions um, during COVID because uh, there was just such a, a demand um, for gloves. But um, that demand is still largely there. Uh, the less we use them, the more, the more easy it is to get those conditions to be improved. This is the report. Um, so if you do want to read it, um, forced labor in the Malaysian medical glove supply chain before and during the COVID pandemic. Um, it's not, it's not a fun read. This is a quote from one of the workers, um, essentially saying that they're, they're in a worse position than slaves because slaves work for free, but they have to pay um, to work at least for that first, first year. So I think we need to start thinking of PPE or the access to PPE that we've got. It's a privilege. You know, when we're, when we're putting that glove on for that task where we don't really need to use it, Let's remember who made it and what conditions they might have to be in. We don't need to use it for vaccination. We don't need to use it for touching patients. Let's at least use these gloves that people have put their literal blood, sweat and tears into. Uh, let's use them appropriately. We can get the gloves off. We can get actual human touch back into nursing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham, for the really insightful talk and certainly brings in the links of social sustainability and ethical procurement to environmental sustainability as well. And we will now pass over to um, Jenny, Professor Jenny Wilson, who is a professor from the University of West London. And Lovely. over to you, Jenny. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, Graham, for that fantastic introduction because I think hopefully that started to get you to think that whereas it's really easy for us to pull on a pair of gloves in healthcare in the UK I hope that those really powerful um, images and information that Graham's given us has made us start to think perhaps that maybe we should think a bit more carefully about when and why we should be using gloves so what I'm going to focus on is why we should use gloves how we use gloves and how that actually puts patients at risk in the way that we use gloves and that we really need to try and change our, our glove use behavior, both to protect our patients, um, but also to try and protect the planet. So the concept of using PPE um, actually didn't really come about until the mid 1980s. And it was really in response to the HIV um, epidemic and it made um, leaders in infection control realize that we needed to be careful with blood and body fluid because exposure to blood and body fluid um, could result in the transmission of bloodborne viruses from patient to healthcare worker or indeed the other way around. Um, that m developed into this concept of standard infection control precautions, which I'm sure you're aware of, although quite often staff are aware of policies without necessarily knowing what the detail um, is contained within that policy. So standard infection control precautions um, includes a whole set of practices designed to minimize the risk of transmission infection in the healthcare setting. It includes hand hygiene, and it includes the safe management of equipment and the environment, but it also includes the use of personal protective equipment. And standard precautions develop that concept of, well, you use, need to use 
gloves for handling blood or body fluid because it might have uh, bloodborne viruses in it. And it said, well, actually, body fluid, particularly feces, but also sputum, urine, it's likely to have pathogens in it because that's where those sort of pathogens exist in high concentrations in those fluids. And what we don't want to do is staff to get those pathogens on their hand and then transfer it from contact with that body fluid onto other things that they touch, other patients, or indeed themselves. So the that concept of using gloves for blood and bloodstained body fluids was developed into use them for contact, direct contact with any body fluid because that's where the risk of contamination is because of the high pathogen load. The other component of PPE is that the process of using PPE should be based on a risk assessment. And the question that needs to be asked is, am I gonna have direct contact with blood or body fluid? If so, if it's just gonna involve my hands, then I need to protect my hands with a pair of gloves. If it's gonna likely to contaminate my uniform, then I need to put a plastic apron or a gown on. And if it's gonna splash into my face, then I need to wear mask and eye protection. And it, there is no indication to wear PPE in any other circumstances, except for that direct contact with body fluid. Although obviously some staff have contact with harmful chemicals and you may re be required to wear PPE for contact with harmful chemicals. Now the WHO very kindly um, in their hand hygiene guideline, which underpins our whole guidance and policy about hand hygiene in healthcare, they actually included um, some guidance about when to use gloves. So on the left-hand side of this table, you can see all those situations where you do have direct contact with body fluids um, and, then, and then gloves are indicated. So those are situations where we should be wearing gloves. Um, but on the green side are a large number of procedures for which you commonly see staff wearing gloves, but for which there is no indication to wear them. These are procedures where you're not going to get blood and body fluid on your hands, and there is therefore no reason to put a pair of gloves on. So things like taking patients' observations, handling used linen, unless it's soiled with blood and body fluid. So just changing a patient's bed, if there's no body fluid there, we don't need to wear gloves. So subcutaneous and, and uh, intramuscular injections, we don't need to wear gloves. IV administration and preparation, there's no contact with body fluid, there's no need to, to wear gloves. Manipulating IV lines, there's no exposure to blood. Bathing, dressing a patient, feeding a patient, and generally helping patients move from A to B that has no contact with blood and body fluid and gloves are not required. Uh, hang on a minute. Uh, I think my mouse has died. So I'm just gonna plug one in. Uh. Nothing is Let happening. Let me know if you need a hand, Jenny. Yeah, I do. Oh, it's yeah. frozen. Okay. Um, let me just, because you've got control. So you haven't got a mouth. Can you use your I, arrows on your keyboard? I can't. Nothing. It's just frozen completely. Oh, okay. All right. So what we will do then is... If you could just stop the recording and yes. if you can you can you stop the share and then we reconnect yes i think what we'll do is i'll i'll just it, we're now recording again and i will go back to that and we should be good now off you go jenny okay if i just say next and i've got quite a lot of build on the slide so yeah You'll have to just bear with me. Do you want me to just build it in? Is that... Yeah, actually, that would work much better. OK, no problem. So that's the first point, that we're wearing gloves when we don't need to wear them. But the other critical component of this is hand hygiene. So we pick up microorganisms on our hands 
when we touch any surface, any things, any people, the microorganism there, you can't see them. Surfaces are not sterile. You pick them up on your hands. But those organisms lie very superficially on the skin. So they are transferred to the next thing that you touch. And hand hygiene is really important because it interrupts the transmission by removing or killing those things that you pick up through touching surfaces and it removes them before you then touch the patient or even more critically, before you touch a susceptible site on the patient, an IV device, a wound and so on. And that's where hand hygiene is so important. It's about interrupting transmission by getting rid of those superficial organisms that you inevitably pick up every time you touch something. The idea that gloves stop that happening is for the birds because gloves pick up organisms in exactly the same way as your hands do. So everything you touch with a pair of gloves on, you're gonna pick organisms up on it and you will then transfer those organisms to the next surface or person that you touch in exactly the same way as your hands. Next slide, please. Um, we know this, um, and I'm gonna give one example of a study where we this was looked at. So, um, this study was done in France. They observed 120 healthcare workers delivering care. They found that 64% of the gloves were not changed after contact with a patient or between procedures on the same patient. Um, and of those um, contacts, almost 20% of them had the potential to introduce infection to the patient. So it was prior to contact with a susceptible site or before some other aseptic procedure. They then sampled 22 pairs of gloves and every pair of gloves grew bacteria. And the vast majority of them grew pathogens. And most of those pathogens were organisms that were on the patient, but they were then transferred or ran the risk of being transferred into their IV line or their, their, their um, catheter. Next slide. The five moments of hand hygiene defines for us the critical points in care when we need to um, decontaminate our hands. So that's the standard illustration we use. But actually, I would argue that the most important moments are that moment one, immediately before contact with the patient, because your hands will be contaminated by things that you've touched, surfaces you've touched before you get to the patient. And you need to make sure that you remove those before you touch the patient so you don't transfer those to the patient. And then moment two, even if you're caring for that patient, you don't want to transfer organisms from the patient's skin, from their bed area, into that aseptic um, site. Next slide. One of the problems with the five moments is it discusses the concept of what's called the patient zone. The patient zone is anything that the patient touches in direct physical contact with the patient. So it isn't the curtains and it isn't their general bed area. So it's no good decontaminating your hands outside the curtains and saying, well, that's fine. I don't need to worry. I'm now near the patient. Um, can you um, move on? Um, and this is an example of how curtains themselves can act as a mechanism of transmission. So this was a group A strep outbreak, two patients with a bloodstream infection, one colonized patient, one, one healthcare worker. They sampled lots of things in the environment and the only place they found this organism was the curtains. And a third of the curtains were contaminated with group A strep because we tend to um, touch lots of things, often with gloves on, move the curtains go and see the patient, maybe have gloves on while we're talking to the patient or dealing with the patient, and then pull the curtains back with those same gloves on. So they act as a mechanism of transferring infection. Next slide, please. And here are some examples, which I'm sure you will be familiar with if you think about it, of how we actually use gloves in practice and how gloves are used in contact with surfaces, but they are not sterile. They will be contaminated. The example of, of the healthcare worker touching the bed space and looking at and also touching a, a monitor. The same with the doctors on that side, the anaesthetists in the surgery. And this is classic, the delivering an IV drug with gloves on, but those gloves are not sterile. In fact, they will be contaminated with all sorts of bacteria that have been picked up as you take whatever drug it is from the clean utility to the patient. Next slide, please. 
And all these examples, gloves are not preventing transmission of infection. They are covering the hands. They will pick up organisms from the hands. But actually, when you take the gloves off, you it's really easy to just transfer whatever is contaminated onto the gloves directly onto the skin. So you still need to wash your hands to remove it. But actually, in all these situations, there's no direct contact with body fluid. You will pick up contamination on your hands in exactly the same way as you would do if you touch surfaces. But that is really easily removed because it's transiently acquired and you just gel or wash your hands and that is removed. Next slide, please. Now, um, part of my interest in gloves um, started in oh, the mid 2010s when I started doing research on glove use. And I'm gonna give you some examples of the data that we found. And this is one of the papers, one of our first papers. We looked at a lot of glove use episodes and we found that on 42% of those glove use episodes, there was no need to use gloves. They were used for low risk procedure, no contact with blood and body fluid. In 37% of those, there was a risk of cross contamination. So they were put on too early or they were removed too late. And hand hygiene was not performed after removal, even though the hands became contaminated when removed. So 40% of times people didn't wash their hands. Next slide, please. If you looked at the number of breaches, according to the five moments of hand hygiene, and so there was a total of 92 episodes of care that we looked at. And of those breaches in the five moments of hand hygiene, 42 of them, so that's almost half of them, were at least two moments of hand hygiene. In 10 of them, there were three moments of hand hygiene breach. And in two of them, there were four moments of hand hygiene breach. So the gloves are being put on. They are not being changed between clean and dirty procedures and between um, touching surfaces and the patient and leaving the patient and touching other surfaces. Next slide, please. And here's some examples of how this happens. So these are actual examples that came from that research. So we watched with the same pair of gloves, empty the catheter bag, gave patient mouth care, check their blood sugar. Same glove, more than one task again. NG feed with a pair of gloves on, then the urine catheter change uh, emptied, and then ET suctioning. Drugs are a huge problem because people often put them on to prepare IV fluids, but then they leave them on. They touch the button to open the door, which will have been touched by hundreds of other people. So we'll be contaminated, push the door open, take the drug to the bedside and deliver that directly into an invasive device on the patient. Central IV line flush. And you can see there, I've highlighted where the flush actually took place, but you can see all the other items touch with that pair of glove immediately before doing the central line flush. If only that person had taken the gloves off, wasn't wearing gloves and gelled their hands immediately before the central line flush, then their hands are going to be decontaminated. The gloves are not. And this example of the blood gas analyzer, this is also very common. People touch themselves, nose, trolley, arm, then the arterial line, monitor, then the arterial line. So lots of contact with other contaminated things, contaminating the hands. Next slide, please. Our, the, the logic associated with how we um, use gloves is it's not based on infection control. It's uh, driven hugely by emotion. So often people feel if they're going to touch somebody, they're concerned about getting, well, as that quote says, bad stuff on me. It's not a specific concern. It's just, oh, I don't want to touch people. But actually, hand hygiene is much safer because you'll still get organisms on your hands if you've got gloves on. But if you don't decontaminate your hands, they're going to stay on your hands as you take your gloves off. Look at some of these ideas around this emotion associated with using gloves. They make me feel safer, more relaxed, more comfortable, more confident. I find that I've got when I've got gloves on, I'm less OCD about needing to wash my hands. So it's something personal that is seen as some form of protection that is not necessary. It's not actually acting as a form of protection. Next slide, please. Um, so what our research has found is that, sorry, we're back one here. Emotion and socialization are key drivers. So glove use is routine. Everybody wears them. And so you do it automatically. You, it, they're worn to protect from things 
perceived to be dirty, but things that don't actually prevent uh, present an infection risk and hand hygiene is perfectly adequate. And then often people will say, oh, well, it's policy, I wear it. But actually, that's not what the policy says. They've not actually looked at the policy and they're not familiar with the detail in the policy. Gloves are perceived to provide a level of sterility. And I think that's why they're commonly used in relation to IV drugs, because they're seen to be sterile, but they're simply not. They don't come out of the box sterile. And as soon as you put them on your hands and start touching things, then they're as contaminated as your hands are. And they're seen as a way of not having to gel your hands. So oh, I've got gloves on, so I don't need to decontaminate my hands. Hand hygiene is perceived to damage skin, but actually people don't realize that those chemicals in glove, the reason that nitrile gloves are so nice to put on and they conform to your hand is because they're full of accelerants that actually trigger dermatitis in some people. So if you get skin problems, the chances are it's the gloves, not the hand hygiene. Um, and the messaging about gloves is really confused because it's not always based on an infection control principle. Actually, this idea that I'm wearing it to protect myself from things that might be dirty has sort of taken hold because, and we need to step back and go towards the principles of when we're using gloves, which is purely for direct contact with blood and body fluid because that's where high concentrations of pathogens are. Um, next slide, please. So if we're going to wear gloves and prevent cross-contamination, we must only put them on immediately before contact with blood and body fluid. And then if we put on them on, we must take them off again, absolutely between patients, but also between procedures. So you should only put them on for a specific procedure where you have contact with blood and body fluid, and then you take them off and you gel or wash your hands. Next slide, please. And then just to finish with, we have to think about the way our work environment is set up and how it drives inappropriate glove use behavior. In many settings, the gloves are located away from the patient. They may be outside the bay or they may be next to the sink. And actually that just encourages staff to put on a pair of gloves long before they get to the bed curtains or the bed space. So we need to think about glove location and we need to make it close to the patient so that staff are able to make that decision. Oh, this particular um, procedure within this episode of care is going to involve contact with blood, blood and body fluid. But I can put on the pair of gloves immediately before I do that, remove them and then gel my hands before going on to the next task. So in combination with glove location, we need to think about alcohol gel location and make it really easy to use. If you look at something like an observation trolley, it absolutely has to have gel on there because that is a much better way of making sure that you decontaminate your hands immediately before you touch the patient, immediately after you touch the patient, you protect the equipment from contamination by dirty hands because you've gelled your hands. Just wearing a pair of gloves and doing the whole procedure with a pair of gloves on just transfers organism from patient to patient. And we need to look at our policies to make sure that they support appropriate glove use behavior. And we take out that sense that, well, we just put them on just in case, because as Graham has illustrated to us, this is critical. We need to start looking at everything we do through the lens of reducing our carbon footprint. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much, Jenny. And um, we got there in the end, but that's which yes. transition into slides. And um, so thank you very much for that. And as we said earlier, we'll take questions at the very end. So if people have questions for any of the speakers so far, do pop them in the chat and we'll come to them at the um, end after our final speaker, who is Sam Clark. And just going to pull up my information here because um, Sam has a number of different roles. So he's a registrar in intensive care medicine, an advanced clinical fellow, co-chair, sustainability and innovation in intensive care network, Cheshire and Mercy, and the work stream lead for PPE, environmental sustainability working group. So over to you, um, Sam. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna talk more about the practical elements of implementing gloves off campaigns. 
Um, as we heard, uh, it, this all started out back in Great Ormond Street, I think it was one of the earlier campaigns, I think it was back in 2014, 2013, 2014. Um, and... Uh, I saw that campaign then and thought, why are we not doing more of this? And it's only just in recent year or two that I've been able to drive change forward across several organisations. Um, as Heather said, I, I work with the Intensive Care Society. We've recently produced this implementation guide, which is is, is based upon a document that um, I produced uh, at one of the sites, Rural University Teaching Hospitals. It's available on the ICS website. I'm sure the guys will put the link within the chat for everybody to see. So my two main experiences are at Rural University Teaching Hospitals and Liverpool University Teaching Hospitals. Liverpool University Teaching Hospital covers three large teaching hospitals, um, the Royal Liverpool, Aintree Hospital and Broad Green Hospital. Um, and I'm also currently um, helping and advising at Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital and Old Hay Children's Hospital as well for their campaigns. Why did I choose gloves? Well, we've already heard from um, Graham how 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 what the impact of gloves is. Um, but this kind of this study uh, in the Netherlands, Humfield et al, um, kind of did a, a big carbon footprinting activity for their intensive care unit and their biggest impact came from disposable gloves both in terms of carbon footprint um, but also in terms of water usage in the production of gloves and we wanted to take on campaigns that uh, start at the produce a more circular economy um so we're not thinking about the end you know are we have we got enough recycling bins we're thinking how can we actually reduce our use uh, reduce the need for and reduce the production of these gloves which has the um, larger part of the um the carbon footprint and water impact and it's a really I, I say this it's a really easy project to take on because it's already endorsed in so many guidelines, so many national guidelines that are endorsed by influential organisations. Um, so the support is there to make these changes. And my first bit of advice really would be to use a model for improvement. I'm a big QI geek. Um, I, in these projects, because they're quite big projects, you refer to the NHS change model. It just helps you to cover every eventuality and think about all the possible components and what could go wrong or um or, or go better um and the susqi framework i've kind of combined the two um to think more um from sustainability point of view and all my quality improvement and i'm going to work through the model on the left on the next few slides so first of all um my kind of biggest recommendation here is, is involvement and it's involving all the relevant people and a lot of people need to get involved in these kind of projects. Um, for me, it started on our um, critical care unit. Um, I reached out to the clinical lead, to the matron um, and, and actually loads of support from them. Um, but it wasn't just kind of the, the, the workers on the ground that had to link in with, it was other teams within the department. Um, I've highlighted IPC team here. Um, everyone asked me or, or asked me quizzically, were they really supportive of this? Did they really want to do this? Um, because they have this concept, misconception, I think, that you know, they're the ones telling you to put on PPE, but they're not actually. They've been the most supportive group um, in both of my organization-wide campaigns. And I would encourage you to reach out to them and, and just highlight to them um, all the all the information that, that we're putting out there now. Um, procurement team. Um, so they're probably somebody in your critical care department who uh, liaises with the procurement team in terms of ordering, etc. They are able to provide you with numbers so they can provide you with how many gloves you're using, how much it's costing. Um, and then there's other kind of visiting teams like IV access team, clinical skills team who are going to be in need of involve, involvement um, because this is a huge change in practice. And then we get to measurement. Um, and this is uh, some work from, from Jenny, who's just spoken. Um, uh, they produced an audit tool, um, again, back in 2015. And I've essentially adapted this audit tool in the two organizations that I've worked. 
Um, and we run this audit both on the critical care units, but also organisation wide. Um, I've made a few little adaptions to it just to make the numbers um, that come out the other end uh, e more easily interpretable and made it into a Microsoft Forms version. Um, and I'm happy to share the template with anybody who wants it. Um, and these are our baseline findings um, at the two different sites. So um, on the left, we've got rural university teaching hospitals on the critical care unit. Um, gloves were worn when not necessary in a whopping 73% of cases. Um, and on the right, we've got two figures here. We've got before at Luft, that's actually the critical care unit, 60.4% not necessary. Um, but we also measured trust wide. So our uh, IPC team, some of the people who are on the call today, very kindly went out across the organisation, across our three sites, looked at 250 observations um, and found that gloves were not necessary in 73% of uh, occasions where they were used. And this has knock-on effects, as Jenny spoke about, on infection control, hand hygiene. Um, shockingly, um, or maybe not, hands were not gelled um, or washed after gloves were taken off in 87% of, of cases at Wirral um, and around the 50s at Liverpool University Teaching Hospitals. Um, and cross-contamination events were extremely common. Um, as Jenny spoke about five moments of hand hygiene, and they occur occurred across um, the range. And so you've got to have a roadmap for change, and this is all about the spread and adoption part of the improvement model. Um, we had our shared vision to reduce glove use, to improve hand hygiene, um, and to save money. Um, we started on both sites uh, a kind of a pilot study on the critical care units and critical care units are great places to start these because they're fairly closed environments. It's fairly easy to implement change and contain it um, within the unit. Um, and in that time, you can you can monitor and evaluate and, and make changes um, whilst you're updating and refining kind of trust wide policy and guidance, which I'm going to come on to in a second. So our guidance, this is taken from one of our posters at, at Liverpool University Hospitals. Um, before you reach for gloves, stop and ask, am I at risk? The risk requiring to wear gloves are direct contact with blood, bodily fluids, mucous membranes, online cat skin, chemical hazards or harmful drugs. Um, so I'm gonna cover that in a second. And if caring for a patient requiring specific IPC transmission-based precautions. This was our medicines advice. I worked with the pharmacy departments in both organisations to kind of produce some helpful guidance around medicines. Generally, gloves are not required, but there are certain medicines where from a cost risk assessment point of view, um, we do recommend glove wearing in those these organisations. Um, And we had to change um, this ANTT guidance, which was well ingrained within both organisations. Thankfully, uh, the IPC teams that I worked with were truly on board with, with altering this and we've altered our guidelines to show gloves off techniques. So disinfecting the tray using um, uh, general disinfectant wipes does not need a glove. Um, preparing medicines, generally gloves not required. Flushing or administering the drug, gloves not required. So we've changed the pictures to show gloves off techniques. And did it work? It seems to have done. Um, so these are critical care before and after um, studies using the same audit tool. Um, and we can see improvements, gloves have been more worn more appropriately. This is in the space of about six weeks in both organizations. So a fairly short time frame on implementation. Um, and still room for improvement, but we are headed in the right direction. Hand hygiene massively improved in both cases and cross-contamination again, uh, probably a, as a result of the above two um, improvements seen, but still work to do. Um, what I just realized I've not included in here is uh, the procurement information. Um, so, uh, we did get the procurement information before and afterwards. And what we've actually done, procurement information is, is interesting. It, it can be difficult to obtain and you need a period of time, usually kind of a financial year, um, to be able to get the numbers that we've used over a year. 
Um, but what we could do is use this data um, from the audit tool to say, well, we're wearing gloves when not necessary in 73% of cases. Um, we're ordering this many gloves, so we use those figures to calculate what your saving is. And that's not the end of it. There's more to go, both from uh, me locally at these organisations, regionally and nationally. Um, we've got further improvements to make in terms of an ongoing education programme. As Jenny was talking about, we're looking at increasing uh, the availability and, and positioning of alcohol-based hand rubs. We've been looking into surface wipes. So from an improvement point of view, some manufacturers of different surface wipes recommend glove wearing, some don't. Um, so for example, um, we've recently been to the uh, Medipal uh, wipe manufacturers and asked them, um, you know, we're thinking of moving to a different wipe because you recommend gloves. Is there a reason for that? Um, and they may well be changing. They've promised that they may be changing the um, uh, information on their packaging, but we know that other gloves are available. And when you're talking to the procurement team about this, and it probably applies to more things than just the surface wipes, you need to think about how these things link in. So if we're, set, we're using a wipe that requires gloves, then as well as the cost of that wipe, you've got a pair of gloves every time you use that wipe. So it's maybe not the cheaper option. Um, we've been looking at waste management in terms of um, availability of bins so that people don't have to walk away from a bed space to dispose of their glove on the other side of the unit. Um, and we're also working on disposable aprons at Liverpool. Um, they've included disposable aprons in their campaign. Um, I'm going to do some work with the ICS and the IPS to try and um, tackle this a little bit more and provide more information. And then finally, on the moment of sustaining improvement, um, we've done a bit of a staff survey. Uh, staff have raised some concerns and misconceptions, such as any contact with an antibiotic can result in resistance. Um, uh, that actually, um, you, you know, there's unseen microorganisms that I'm at risk from. Well, yes, there is, but actually the way to improve that is your hand hygiene, um, things like that. So we're going to start a social media campaign over the next few weeks at Luft to kind of dispel some of these myths. Both organisations um, are planning or in the process of making the gloves off audit part of their hand hygiene audit. Um, because they realised there were stark differences between these. There was a 99% compliance in hand hygiene um, at WUV, um, but then we saw that 50-something percent um, non-compliance um, in the gloves off data. I'm linking with universities in the region as well to make sure that their clinical skills teaching is in line. Um, and I've been working with the uh, integrated care systems procurement network um, to look at sustainable procurement of gloves. Um, that is an even more tricky region and something which you could talk about for a whole um, hour in itself, um, but there is work to be done there. Um, and I'm also working um, with the networks across the region to incorporate sustainability into our governance structures um, through creating this sustainable practice and innovation in ICU network across our region. And that is everything from me. Great. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, I'm sure everybody would agree we could listen to this for so much longer. <laughs> Just really helpful, practical advice, strategic policy advice, research links and things. And um, we've got some time now for some questions. There's one question in the Q&A. And so I will put this to either Jenny or Graham or maybe both of you. Um, current ANTT, so aseptic non-touch technique guidance, advocates the use of gloves, which is giving conflicting advice to our staff. Are you aware of any plans to update national ANTT guidance? And that's from Jude Burnett. Um, Graham, do you want me to start? Yeah, go for it, Jenny. I know we've both had conversations on this. Yeah. So... ANTT is a concept developed by a team of vascular access professionals at UCLH in London. It's clearly a helpful framework to help teach what can be quite a complex subject area around managing 
procedures aseptically, but it doesn't have any magic associated with it. An aseptic procedure is an aseptic procedure. It basically means you don't bring anything that is non-sterile in contact with a sterile body site. Um, so the framework is very useful, but it's not national policy. It's a, a framework that many trusts, probably most trusts, choose to use because it provides resources to help support the training and competency development of their staff. And the issue of using gloves for um, procedures designated for ANTT has been a source of discussion between IPS and the ANTT team for probably at least five years. Um, because from an infection control perspective, we are really concerned about how gloves are recommended. And we feel that as experts in the fields of field of infection control, that we should be able to influence that. But we've not met with a great deal of success. And to be honest, it's a matter of applying the principles. And that, that's what it should be about. Uh, we've explained when you should wear gloves. Um, I have looked quite recently, actually, for evidence that PPE is necessary for handling drugs. And there's very little evidence to suggest that it contributes in any way to protecting staff from any risk. In fact, you're possibly at greater risk from putting the gloves on because we know that gloves call, call, cause contact dermatitis. I think there's a, another misconception that maybe feeds into it, which is that idea that people may not clean their hands properly. So let's use gloves instead. Yes. Um, and we all know that gloves, well, that they're, as Jenny said earlier, they're, they're not sterile. They were never sterile when they arrived and they've since been touched by loads of people grabbing them out of the box or shoving them back in when they've fallen on the floor. Um, so that, that's just a complete um, incorrect um, impression that gloves gloves are somehow clean. We, we shouldn't think of them in that way. Sam, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so this is something that I've spent a long time trying to tackle as well across organisations and for the ICS. Um, the audit tool that I, I used, we were able to see from that that actually ANTT procedures were a, um, a huge risk area in terms of cross-contamination and it's more associated when people are wearing gloves. Um, so we were able to use that support within the organisations to say we need to look at what we're doing here and think about it. The other side to it is the um, handling drug side of things, which are numerous questions from pharmacists about um, in the most recent organization that I've worked with at, at, at Luft, um, uh, their health and safety team were really helpful in saying that actually the product inserts that come in the um, drug packaging are um, risk assessments for kind of the industrial scale use of those medicines. Um, so, and actually they don't constitute a, a COSH risk assessment. You have to do your own risk assessments about drugs. Um, so I was able to take that back to the pharmacy department and, um, kind of get support that way to say, actually, um, it's all about how long you're exposed to and, and how high risk that medicine is. So chemotherapy agents, which are, um, tend to be very, um, get this right or wrong, very alkaline substances you know, a minimum amount of contact cause a high amount of harm, um, whereas that's not true of most drugs. And then lastly, um, as Jenny said, you're less likely to cause harm um, if, um, if you're following ANTT, um, the principles of ANTT properly. Um, I've, from an infection control point of view, I have spoken to the ANTT organisation and actually they don't advocate, so that they, they're not advocating uh, glove use from an infection prevention control point of view it was more to cover in terms of that cosh side of things um, which they said uh, their line to me was needs to be assessed on a um, individual organization basis um, so that's the feedback I've had from them and I've included again that in the ICS IPS guide as well to reference to um, hopefully that will be of help and uh, I think it's just been such a fascinating discussion of, you know, the themes throughout around behavior change and, you know, the science that's there, the policies that there. But I'll just quote Ria, who made a comment earlier on, just kind of a question, kind of a comment, Ria. Um, brilliant presentations. How do we get every single glove wearer to see this? 
and more importantly, <laughs> not just see this recording, to do the implementation, because it feels like, you know, the knowledge is there. And um, Louise, you've um, reiterated that, that you were thinking the same thing. Um, and it's really about behavior change. And Sam, you've given a really excellent example of quality improvement and using that kind of SUSQI lens that people have used the SUSQI model before around um, imp actual implementation of the science, getting over the fears and myths that Jenny explored and, you know, the, the context that Graham presented at the uh, very beginning about just why this is so important. We can't afford it financially. We can't afford it environmentally. And there's all sorts of social implications as well. Um, most importantly, um, or just as important, <laughs> improving the quality of care for our patients and making sure that, you know, that safe quality of care is, is the um, answer. Um, there's just a few more questions here. Uh, Chloe's asked, this is really motivating, inspiring stuff. Thank you. Apologies if I've missed this earlier. Do you have any hints about how I can find out if you are already working on this in my trust? I'm relatively new there, GSTT. That sounds like guys in St. Thomas's, I think is an abbreviation. Um, so Chloe, I've got some contacts. Yes. <laughs> I, I just, guys in St. Thomas's. So I yes. if anybody else wants to comment. Yes, the um, John Otter, who's the director of infection control there. I know he's been trying to kick, kick off some um, gloves off work and I'm sure he'd be really keen um, to hear from some enthusiastic clinical staff who'd be willing to collaborate on it because often it, it is all about teamwork and it's about getting people on board and often infection control really struggle to find the right group of people who will really help them take this work forward and it's it has a real snowball effect if you can get one unit to do it particularly intensive care because you're seen as as such experts um and and have such direct and intense patient contact so if you can change the approach to using gloves it often mm -hmm. disseminates much more easily throughout the rest of the hospital so contact john otter um in the infection control team and i know we've just gone to time but just to spill over a little bit people have to go this is being recorded um chloe i don't know if trish mccready's on the call but one of the sisters in um guys and say thomas is i see you who i think i don't know if she's still doing that role but she was infection prevention uh, contact for a link nurse or whatever it's called there and uh, it's got a particular pet peeve wouldn't you say Louise for those of us who know Trish well she's always got thing about gloves and I've been collaborating with her on various things so um, she leads the ICU sustainability group um, so there's quite a lot of work there that I think has been started already. Sam you've got your hand up. Yeah it was just to say chime in on that kind of more generally speaking across organizations your IPC team definitely just reach out to them, drop them an email, ask them. They'll be more than happy to reply out from my experience. They're not the dragons everybody thinks they are. Um, and secondly, every organisation will have a sustainability team. They are mandated to have a, a green plan, um, which they will have in place. And there will be a team of people working towards sustainability goals within the organisation. And this is a huge one. So if you reach out to, if you <laughs> find your sustainability group, your sustainability lead and reach out to them, um, they will hopefully be able to direct you in the right place. And if your ICU group doesn't yet have a sustainability group, start one. They're, you know, they're popping up all the time. And um, Louise, you were about to say something. No, there was. I was just going to highlight there's another question in the Q&A box. Oh, do you um, mind asking it? Sorry, I'm yeah, no, struggling to keep up with it. Um, uh, could you recommend the most ecologically friendly type of disposable glove? glove? from carbon cost and microplastics for general use in general practice? That's yeah, that a could give us question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the best way is not to use them. Um, that there, there is a company um, who've set up a European um, glove manufacturer rather than transporting all the way from uh, the Far East. So um, we're about to do a trial of their glove. Um, it, it's made um, in a it's made using less um, human uh, input. It's uh, it of a higher quality, supposedly, so you 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 don't get the breakages, and it, and also they've got a dispenser, so you can take one at a time rather than loads falling out. So we're we're about to do a trial at my trust of of that and see whether it actually does make the difference that it plans to. But it it, it should at least have a, a better carbon footprint. But um, early stages and too early to report back. One of my colleagues at the University of Brighton is a material scientist and does a lot of work around microplastics and nanoplastics and poly this and poly that and systems and that kind of area. 
because for the rest of us, we think plastics are plastics, but it's never quite that simple, is it? Um, and um, I was thinking about booking him for one of these seminars. So maybe we should do one on microplastics as a, as a theme for an upcoming seminar. So um, I've just asked Louise if there's any other questions. Thank you very much, Louise. And also Eleanor in the background. Eleanor Dam is the co-lead of the Environmental Sustainability Working Group at the Intensive Care Society, along with Hugh Montgomery. And um, both the ICS and the BCCN and uh, FICOM group, for those in the IC community know FICOM and the UK Critical Care Nursing Alliance have been collaborating on coming up with some guidance, just generally speaking, for environmental sustainability. So watch this space. Hopefully that's in development over 2024. Many of you in the call, I know, are involved in that. And I'm assuming gloves and PPE is going to be a big theme in it. So that's something to look out for. And also in the upcoming um, updated version of the GPICS. Some of us who are in the call are also involved in that, and there'll be some standards and recommendations for all intensive care units. Um, so it's just a great opportunity to link in experts from the Infection Prevention Society and other experts in the fields with um, those of us in the ICU community that are, are working um, towards this um, sustainability agenda. There's lots of links in the chat if you haven't yet checked out the chat and um, the Intensive Care Society webpage and um, the BCCN also have a position statement. And Louise, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to say on behalf of the BCCN, you had your hand up there. Oh, no, no, it's nothing to do with that, actually. It was a, a Rachel had asked a question and I answered it and then the question disappeared, but it was about the resources that Sam had used that I put in that, that it's all on the ICS website, so do check out yeah. that. That if website. you just Google Intense Care Society Sustainability, you'll find a, a whole host of different resources um, or gloves in particular, and you'll find um, those links there. I've also put the links for the next two Critical Care Susnet meetings. So the next one will be on the 11th of January. It's on the theme of fellowships. So Ria, who I mentioned earlier, and um, Imogen Stringer and Jason Dalton are all currently or have done a sustainability related fellowship. So it'll be along those kinds of themes, just showcasing that, you know, you can do a fellowship in sustainable critical care now. And um, also some of their projects they'll be happy to share, I'm sure. And then we thought we'd just have an open discussion, not necessarily a theme, but just let's all gather and who's doing projects, who's having struggles, who's made successes. And so 21st of February is just purely open agenda. We'll just all arrive and talk about what people want to talk about. And we're in the process of setting up themes for the rest of the year. So if there's any particular themes that you would like to have in the um, upcoming webinars or any particular aspects of the sort of more open agenda meetings, um, please feel free to come along. The Centre for Sustainable Healthcare Critical Care Susnet um, Network is something that you can join. It's free to join. If you go to, um, Louise, do you mind popping that in the chat, um, the, the network website? Thank you. And you get registered with the username and password. And you can ask questions on the blog site. You can make comments. If you've done a project, share it on there or come to one of our meetings and do, do showcase it. Another thing to think about is please publish things. There's very little published on sustainability related topics um, in intensive care. And there's some great audits and quality improvement projects um, as well as research that are going on out there. And, and you know, fantastic to disseminate, to let other people know about it um, through publications as well. Most of the intensive care Conferences now seem to have a sustainability um, abstract opportunity. So conference dissemination is another thing to think about. And I don't know if there's any final thoughts from any of the speakers. Any last top tips from each of you? A, a one word summary top tip. Graham, we'll start with you. Think before you put them on. We've got into habits of putting gloves on, haven't we? And quite often you question staff and say, why have you got gloves on? And they look surprised that they've even got them on their hands. They haven't even realised they've done it. Um, so we just need to get out of that habit. And Jenny? Yeah, I. Uh, my big passion is alcohol gel. I really <laughs> wish that people would see alcohol gel as their friend in healthcare and much better than gloves. It's so much more immediate. Mm. It's so quick and easy. You can do it as you're going on to the next task. So just a big plea to start using gel rather than gloves. And for countries where water shortages are a significant concern, yeah. it also helps to address yeah. another environmental planetary health issue. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And Sam, final comment? Um, I, I, I want to make 
I want to make two. First of all, okay, you're is, to. Is, is reiterating, <laughs> in fact, IPC nurses are not the dragons we think they are. Like there is a huge, as we've seen today, group of them involved in this. Um, and that links into my second thing, which is um, uh, just we need to be sustainable in healthcare. Um, we are huge impacts in critical care and gloves is a great starting project because a lot of the work is already done. Um, so if you're thinking about it, speak to IPC, speak to your sustainability, speak to your lead nurse and just do it. Um, sounds like the Nike slogan, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Kaz has asked about slides and yes, all the presenters have agreed um, for the slides to be shared. And they've also kindly agreed for this recording to go onto the Center for Simple Healthcare Network's YouTube page. So it'll be freely available. So you could use it as an education resource if you're doing education and trying to disseminate information in your local units. And a lot of what we've talked about today has been in the context of ICU, but if there's any non-ICU people today, I think, you know, good principles on gloves is the same, you know, wherever you work. So um, do use these resources um, as best suits you. So um, thank you, Louise, for um, filling the chat. I was just trying to put the implementation guide link, but it's gone funny, but whether that link will take you there or not, but it, if yeah. you, it goes through from the ICS website. It does. So. And if you scroll down, there's, I think it's on the right hand side from memory. Yeah. So, and also the gloves posters that the Intense Care Society launched in March. So um, I'm a bit, say, the technical support, I'm not very technical. So I, I think we all declared at the beginning, many of us are teams people, not Zoom people, <laughs> but we've got there in the end. And um um, always good to have backup slides on 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 hand. We've learned that in the pandemic, haven't we? So uh, all was well. So on that note, I wish you all a great afternoon and happy gloves off campaigns and, um, and fantastic projects. Sounds like that are in the works. And as I said, do keep disseminating and um, and sharing your, your great projects. And we look forward to um, our next critical care assessment on the 11th of January, hearing from three fellows who are doing fantastic work in this agenda around greening up ICUs. And um, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. And thank you again to all the speakers. Fantastic presentations.